Welcome back to the Million Dollar Landscaper Podcast. Today, I'm excited to bring on today's guest. Today, we have Rich Johnson. He's the owner of Johnson Landscape Manufacturing and also the owner of Johnson Landscape Maintenance. We also have uh, David Sen, who's also his operations manager and designer over at JLM. And today, I'm excited to bring him on because we are going to be chatting about organization in your landscaping. We're going to be talking about productivity and efficiency in your landscaping business because it is so, so important. You know, you could be doing millions of dollars of landscape uh, work every year and bringing all kinds of money, but if your crew is not efficient, not doing things in a good order and you're getting callbacks and all kinds of issues, you're not going to have any money. So today's guest, we're going to chat mm-hmm. a little bit about that. Um, Rich, and them, they own a small, own, they're, they're, I'm sorry, they're a owner of a small family owned landscape business. They've been doing this for over 20 years, guys, 20 years. So this is going to be an episode you do not want to miss. Um, like I said, they also own the Johnson Landscape Manufacturer and they, so they create products that not only help keep your business organized, but also keep the productivity up. And we're going to go into that here a little bit. So welcome, Rich. Welcome, David. Thank you guys for being on the show. No, thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, we're just hoping we can be a benefit for somebody. Yeah. And and a little before we started here, guys, I want to share with you, these guys are on, mm-hmm. you know, this landscape business, like I said, for 20 years, but they are like what you consider like your typical average size landscape company, you know, the 300 to $500,000 range as, as Rich said. And this is awesome. I love hearing this kind of input from people. You know, we, we do get on other guests that you know, different levels. So it's always kind of nice to have a different perspective from whatever level of business they're at. So I love having you guys on here. No, so, that's great. Because, yeah. And that's great. And that's really where we land, you know, yep. sometimes a little more, you know, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but, but yes. So Rich, you mind just sharing a little bit of a background on, you know, the landscaping side and then kind of a little bit what got you started in the manufacturing side of things and what you actually manufacture. Sure. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. In a brief nutshell, really what got us going is um, I was living in Valparaiso. This this is northwest Indiana where we're at. And it's a a smaller community. Basically, we were living there. I was working in uh, human resources for United States Steel. So I was a technical training specialist for U.S. Steel. And that was my my degree finished up and I went there. So while we were living in this little subdivision, um, my wife grew up in a more rural area, much more rural. Long story short, she said, you know what? If we moved out and we had some land, you know, we could do a lot more. You could ride your dirt bikes and stuff like that. And I said, oh, that's a great idea. So what do I do? I go buy a dirt bike, you know, because I used to race motocross. So we, I did that. Basically, from there, we found a home, and we moved out into a small town called Westville. And that gave me about five acres of land. And, of course, what do you do? I've always liked to have my own business. But what do I like to do? I said, you know what would be great is to have my own business. And we've got this great big yard we have to fix and mow. So I went and bought a mower and trailer and had this stuff for my own spot. And then I thought, gosh, I need a pickup truck. So I bought a Dakota, you know, uh, and I can fix everything. So we, we did all the repairs on it. And that's what started it. And a friend said, hey, I need some help mowing a yard. Can you come help me? And I said, sure. So I had my first zero turn mower, which is a little X Mark 60 inch mower. And it just kind of grew from there. And once I had that, I started doing little things on the side saying, you know, I got to pay for all this stupid, expensive mower and this and that and that. You know what I mean? And so we just started working a little bit at a time. And then I really started to enjoy it. So after a little while, about 11 years after I left or I was working at U.S. Steel, I went from there uh, and had this home uh, in Westville. So I'm sorry, it's kind of getting a little distracted. But, um, basically what it is, I started here in about three years, maybe four years. Of living here in this five-acre plot of land, I started growing a little bit here, doing a little bit more for somebody else, and a little bit more for somebody else. And then all of a sudden, U.S. Steel comes on and says, you know what? We're laying people off. And I knew that was coming. That's the nature of the steel industry in our area. It has ups and downs. So needless to say, after my 11th year, I was on my downswing, and I knew it was coming. I had a really good boss. He said, look, you know, the changes in the wind. So as I built this little tiny fledgling business, I had five kids living here. Now, one day I came to my wife and I said, you know what? I guess it's over. We're going to start landscaping. I enjoy doing it. So we just started right there. So I had that little Dodge Dakota, one single axle trailer and a mower and a push mower and a few things and a lot of desire. And so we just took the leap of faith with all five of those kids and left U.S. Steel 
um, and then started the business. And from there, it was like I worked nonstop because I had five children at home to take care of and my wife and I to grow. So it was very busy. It would be, goodness, you know, uh, in fact, I was, I was doing this while I was at U.S. Steel. So imagine going to U.S. Steel at 6, get off at 3, come home at 4, get my truck, go out and work. Sometimes I'd be working until 11 at night. I put lawn, I put lights on my mowers, on my <laughs> mower, so I could work at night, and that's just what I did. So you just kind of kept growing and talking to people. So in a nutshell, it was just hard work and a lot of effort and perseverance, and that's really what it takes in this business because there's a lot of people that'll do it for less. Yeah. Um, mine, I was trying to be right, hadn't learned about numbers yet, still trying to just make things meet and make ends meet. Uh, it was just a lot of hard work. So imagine going from full-time job, comfortable insurance and everything, to Allison awesome going, you, this is what you got. Yeah. And then just started working. So a little lengthy there, but that's basically what it is. We just started right from a Dodge Dakota, single axle trailer, <laughs> 16 checks mark mower, a push mower, weed whacker, and a backpack mower. And I just started doing maintenance. Nice. Okay. And it just grew from there. What types of services do you provide nowadays? Well, now it's kind of grown quite a bit since then. We're still sure. in maintenance. Maintenance is our heaviest, let's say our heaviest area. Sure. But because once I started going, we started, um, and this is something I did different than probably most people. And it's good or bad, like it or dislike it. For me, it was if I can't buy it and pay for it right then, I didn't buy it. So my first Bobcat track loader, you know, I have, or my first truck we bought was in 2003. And that one I did take a loan out, but I paid that back in six months. You know, we, that was our first truck because that's another whole story with the Dakota and plowing snow. That was, my kids <laughs> never forget the Christmas. I was out plowing snow. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> we can come to that some other time. Um, so right now our, our main emphasis is, um, I could say, you know, it's kind of interesting. We do driveways. We've done um, land clearing. We've done uh, soil jobs. We've dug basements for homes. We've done septic systems. That's when I was, you know, doing certified as septic. We were doing um, uh, tree removal, root removal. We actually did a road for a subdivision. They had a <laughs> 40 or 50 feet or 100 feet? 100, 120 100 feet. feet. We had short little connector road. There's a connector road, a subdivision hired just for it. Because at that point, we had grown where we had with track loaders and excavators and the bobcats and the dump truck and you know we had a lot of the equipment by that time sure but again that started very little so each year i would try and acquire something else that would make my job easier we do stump grinding now because we have a stump grinder we have a, a diesel wood chipper that we use for you know land clearing jobs and, you know the typical small hand equipment but imagine though we started from just a little bit so each year i'd go okay what's in the budget what can i afford this year that will make my life easier and make it more efficient. And so each year we tried to acquire something new. Now, the first thing for me was a little Coyote uh, 35 horse tractor. And you know what? If I was in the same boat again today, I would tell somebody to start out with a, a garden tractor, you know, a, a, about a mid sized 35 horse, because that tractor put us into just going on everything. Uh, we were, I can't even tell you how many yard installs we did with that little uh, 35 horse um, coyote tractor with a tiller and stuff and a Harley rake in the back. Nice. And then that front end loader. Oh my gosh. I, I can't, I can't even imagine. I can't tell you how many tons of dirt and stone and mulch that that little tractor moved for us, you know, yeah. when I first got it. So I still say that was a good, that was one of my best investments at that time, you know? So yeah, to answer your question, we do a lot of, a lot of maintenance, but that maintenance isn't just mowing. You know, we did hardscapes for a while. We've done some patios. We've done retaining walls. We've done a lot of drain tile work and swale work, you know, for um, remediation of water. We do quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. And we're still doing a lot of that, you know. Recently, like we talked about earlier, you and I chatted, nature trails. And we've been doing a lot of trail building. David's great in the sense that we have built bridge, you know, we're doing boardwalks and we can draw up. David just gets on the computer. I said, this is what we got to do. Draw it up. Nice. He draws it up and puts it together and we can send off to the customer with just rudimentary software. Now, David uses uh, Fusion 360, okay. yep. which is a CAD software. 
It just draws it really neat. Yes. I didn't spend a lot of money on high-end, um, let's call it landscape software, because it I didn't see it, the need for it in what I was doing, right? Yeah. So basically, that's where we're at. You know, it's a mix. Or you cut sure. in our intermix. <laughs> now, in your area, <clears throat> is it, do you mainly service all just, I know you said Westville, it's kind of a rural area. Do you serve any other areas or is it all pretty much rural area that you do serve? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. A lot of the times we're in basically like our Westville, LaPorte, Porter County, let's call it Porter County, LaPorte County. Uh, we've done some work in Lake County. Um, we've even gone down as far as, uh, what is that, Rochester? Did one job in Rochester. Did a, you know, re, uh, some kind of a, a little, little wall and, and, and a wall and a sidewalk. Walkway. walkway. Okay. You know, so nice. okay. let's say within that 100 mile radius. Now, oddly enough, I've had a few calls because we have some odd, we got quite a collection of equipment now. Mm-hmm. A solar panel company just got a hold of us down last year and we did probably 500 foot of trenching okay. with one of our tracked trenchers to uh, so they can install their own uh, cable lines. Yeah, so that's really eclectic. I have to be honest with you. <laughs> you know? Well, the, the solar panels seem to be popping up, at least here in, in Lake County, cool. it's popping up all over. I know my dad's for his landscape business has gone out there, graded them and started maintaining them and stuff too. It's, it's, they're popping up all over. Yeah, everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> the largest solar field in the country is in my county, Stark County. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Stark, Stark and Plask got together. This area is big for solar for some reason. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of crazy. I know here in Maryville, it's, there's another solar field farm coming in here pretty soon. So yeah, it's, it's just crazy. It's, and it's a, it's a nice little market, I guess, if you can get in there and maintain it and do whatever it's, it's a little difficult to maintain. I'll say that from our side, when we had it for a while, it's a, <laughs> kind oh, of yeah. a pain, it, it, it's, it's definitely got some maintenance issues, but on the landscape side, <laughs> uh, our school here just recently put in a landscape. Let's say maybe that was two years ago. They put in the lands, uh, the solar panel setup. And for okay. us as landscapers, it was nice because once all that was in, they needed remediation of all the soil around the, uh, the panels. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we, as a landscaper, we came in with smaller equipment and Harley rakes and cleaned up all around the field. Yep. You know, all around nice. the uh, solar panels. And we did that. Heck, this brings us to another thing. So you want to talk about eclectic? Uh, one of the other things we did is a soccer field for the school. Um, Westfield School needed a soccer field, and they had this mountain of dirt that we ended up moving, probably four or five, six hundred yards, probably even more than that, because we had... It's got to be more than that. We were there three straight days. Three straight three, days. Three loaders. Three front-end loaders that we had. You know, I had a big one, so we had to level it out, crown the field, get it graded, get it leveled, you know, all smooth, compacted, and then set, so you actually had drainage. You know? Nice. And hence, nice. That comes in where you have um, education and learning. The old cliche statement, knowledge is power, right? So again, with that knowledge, just learning a little bit, how to set your grades, how to set, use your laser. Most of us in the landscape world, we should have that. We should be able to use a laser. We should be able to use a a board. Now we've gotten lazy and I just use what they call a zip level. And the zip line level is probably one of our favorite tools because it's quick and dirty. Simple, simple. yeah, I like it because it's one person, especially if you're doing estimates, you can go out there and see your heights really quick and easy with that versus always had to bring somebody along if I had to get some measurements of the old uh, laser no or laser whatever. Stick. <laughs> yep. We yep. just yep. did a job the other day where it, we were repairing a um, drainage drain tile out of a basement and the fall of the land went from five feet where he had initially found where the clog was to zero in about 30 feet of run. <laughs> the zip level was ideal because it was extremely hard to control the trencher sure. by eye, you know, as you're going down. Yeah. So, you know, and that there's one of those tools for, uh, you know, let's call it the budget-friendly landscaper that's easy to teach his, his employees because they can read the zip level very easy. So if you want to put a plug-in for, you know, not an advertisement for zip line <laughs> or zip level, but I will tell you that that tool is great for when we do walls or we do anything that's fast and dirty. Well, that that's exactly it. Trying to get somebody to understand the concept of using the transit and you have to like almost, I don't know, I tell people you got to almost think in reverse. Yeah. yeah it's like, it know. is in reverse. It is. Yes. And, and you have and to think about it that way. You have to teach them that. And, yep. and that's why, and we had that and we have one still. We still use Dave yep. and I'll still use that if we need to when we're going deep, mm-hmm. you know, deeper than we can reach at the zip level because we've done some deep drench, uh, 
you know, six, eight, nine feet deep uh, drain tile trenches for people. And when you have to go that deep, you have to use it. But I'll tell you yeah. what, zip level for that, for landscapers are just, you know, I, I can't even, it's a great tool. How about that? It's, it's <laughs> well worth the investment. Well worth it. it. Is. That, that's one tool that's <laughs> easy to teach a lot of people and it's fast. Yeah. You know? yeah. We want to take a quick second to tell you about our friends over at Cycle CPA. I can't even express to you how important it is to have a good accountant on your side. You know you want accurate bookkeeping and financial statements every month. Instead, you're often left with limited time to focus on the accounting side of your business and no reports to show for it. At Cycle CPA, the landscaping accountants, they not only handle the bookkeeping, but also provide landscape industry benchmarking, job costing, financials by service line, advisory meetings, and much more. Cycle CPA has a team of landscaping accountants available to provide anything from bookkeeping to CFO services. Visit CycleCPA.com and for $100 off, mention the Million Dollar Landscaper podcast. So just curious now, you you, yeah. you started creating, you know, you had your landscape business and you decided you're going to start getting into some of the manufacturing side of things. You mind sharing a little bit what got you into that and actually what you are producing and what, what types of products do you guys have? Sure. Yeah, you know that that's a kind of a, a nice story because really at, at that in our landscape business, I like cars and so I do a lot of mechanical work. Uh, David's been on a farm most of his life, so he knew mechanical work. Uh, it's just second nature. So for us, again, going back to the landscaper, it's really, really important to understand how to repair and maintain your own equipment because one of the things that has really brought us dividends or bought us dividends is the fact that we can maintain all of our equipment. That's just from trucks, trailers, our mowers, our small power equipment. You just got to learn how to do that. You got to know how to take care of the basics. We've done engine rebuilds on our mowers. We've done pump changes, everything. I we, could almost build a lot more from spare parts. You know, <laughs> what's on the shelf. Yeah, and, that, and so, so I'll have to get back to your thing. That's imperative. You have to know how to, to take care of that stuff. I, I mean, Maybe there's a lot of companies out there that source out everything, but I don't know how they can afford to do that. Yeah. Again, this is what you and I chatted briefly about this. I can make a ton of money, but it's not how much I make, it's how much I keep in my pocket. Yeah. And the one way to keep that money in my pocket is being knowledgeable enough to understand how to do some of my repairs, understand how to do that. So what we did is everything we tried to look at is what can I do that will save me a penny? What can I do that will save me? First, it's a dollar. Then it's a uh, 50 cents. Then it's a quarter. Then it's a dime. Then it's a penny. So what can I do that's going to save me a penny, right? Mm -hmm. What can I do that's going to be 1% better today than I was yesterday? The whole business mantra has got to be set up on what can I do better today than I did yesterday? Whether that's learning numbers, what your business is run on, or learning how to repair your own stuff. So everything in our shop, we eventually got to the point where we said, hey, you got a flat tire. Okay, take the tire off, take it to the tire shop. I said, enough of that. We stopped that business really fast, and I invested in our own tire machine, and we invested in our own tire balancer. We invested in our own shop lift. So we can do our own tires here at the shop. We can balance our own tires. We can put our things on the lift. You know, we bought a big air compressor and stuff. Again, what can I do that's going to be 1% better today than it was yesterday? Right? So everything we did, we started to do that. And so that comes into JLM. Here we are using a truck. I'm going to go do a mulch job. So I have my you know, Ram 5500 dump truck with an 11-foot box. We're going to go do a small mulch job, maybe eight, nine yards. Fill the dump truck up with mulch. Okay, where do I do with the, the wheelbarrows or the tools I'm going to use to go move that mulch? Okay, well, I guess we take another truck in the trailer or I tow a trailer behind the dump truck it becomes an issue. I got to park, get rid of the trailer, move the dump truck and, and figure out what I'm going to do. For us, we decided, well, goodness gracious, I have this truck. I've got snow plow mounts on the front of that truck. Why don't we just develop something to carry our wheelbarrows or our plate compactor, or whatever we're doing on the front of the truck so I can eradicate using a second truck or a trailer. Again, this is what can I do to save a, a dollar, a dime, a, a penny? All of us, it was all about being more efficient today than I was yesterday. 
So over time, Dave and I developed this thing. We kind of drew up an idea. So this is what I'd like to do. So we drew up an idea and started making things that will slide into the front plow mounts of the trucks that we can utilize. So all of a sudden, now the dump truck, full of mulch. Scary, yes. We see a lot of people, you put your wheelbarrows on, your wheelbarrows on top of the mulch pile. You got to climb up there. Then you got to worry about a guy falling out and risk and damn. And I'll tell you what, 11 years at U.S. Steel, when I dealt with the unions, I had to deal with a lot of um, incidences, you know, safety incidences, incidents. And one injury is multiple years of expense, hmm. right? So I don't want to have my employees hurt. You know, we hated having to get up on there. That's why we always took a trailer. But now all of a sudden, dump truck full of mulch, wheelbarrows go in a basket that we made that goes in front of the dump truck. Nobody has to get up on top of it. The wheelbarrows are there. I use one truck. So oh, now wow. this small job that's going to be done, we've eradicated a truck. We can put three guys in the dump truck. They can go do this job and only have one truck, easy to park, no injuries, nobody's climbing on the top, easy to deal with. You can send the employee that can't tow a trailer now. Yes. Yep. You couldn't send them before. Yep. Because yep. not everybody can tow a trailer, and everybody that has towed a trailer knows that. Yeah. Yep. You know? <clears throat> Yeah, that's well, speaking of the trailers portion, that's what we used to have, you know, the truck and trailer set up like normal for maintenance. And I, I convinced my dad, like, we need to look at these Isuzu trucks, you know, with the Isuzu. dovetail beds and stuff. And it, that was a game changer once we did that. That was that's so nice because we didn't have to worry about the trailer issues. Like every morning, it seemed like I was fixing a trailer light or something connection they messed oh. up or whatever. And then, yeah. you know, every single day I'm like, let's do that and eliminate that. And then we didn't have to worry about the trailers backing up or jackknifing or whatever. It was so nice. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and, and it's funny you say that because, you know, we even looked at doing the Isuzu's um, in the trucks, but <laughs> what I tried to figure out is, can I use that to do multiple things? What I found for me in our, in our small niche is that I can only use it for three seasons. I couldn't really get it for plowing. Unless I got the Mitsubishi Fuso, which is the four-wheel drive version, then its problem was its carrying capacity was too light or its towing capacity was too little. Um, yeah. So but we didn't do that. But yes, that, that we looked at that's a great idea for certain for certain setups. Yeah. You know, and you do, you eradicate the trailer. Just, yeah, trailers yeah. are let's let's be honest. They're a headache. <laughs> they going, are. You know, and going to trailers, this is another thing. Again, trying to be more efficient. David uh, made a um, a trailer adapter, a tester. So it's a he's a computer power source, and we put it all he put it all together so we could plug it into the trailer and check our trailer brakes, check our trailer lights, brakes, turn signals, just a little module it, so we can test our trailers every year. Yeah, there's commercial examples. There's commercial. Out there. They're like two hundred bucks. We yep. had the thing laying around. It was a winter day. Had nothing better to do, so I made it. Build a tool. I did the same thing. I took a toolbox, an old toolbox, it had the flip up top there, and I put my switches in there, put a battery in there, and plugged it in the side. Because we had, at the time, my dad wanted two different types of plugs, which was another story. But <laughs> so I made two different, I, I'm not going to get into that. But yeah, yeah. We had two different plugs in there. So you can use whatever trailer mount that was there or trailer plug was there. You can plug it in and test it. But yeah, I did the same thing because, yeah. And now that you said they have these units out there, I'm like, man, that's another thing. Like, I could have made something like that all the time. (laughs) Whatever. Yeah. No, I I, I love the fact that you guys took something like with the plow mounts and made something on there to make it more efficient, to make your, your, your crews, you know, safer and and a little more organized. I love that idea. Yeah. So imagine this too. We had going into that again, since I had that experience with us steel and I was in the uh, technical training and resource, you know, resource development. Um, also, I dealt with the safety crews all the time, you know, safety department, because, you know, I had to deal with new employees. The, the biggest thing was just worrying about safety. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to have anybody get hurt on my job. If we're a small crew. If somebody's hurt on our job, that really makes an impact on our, our day. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have a crew of, you know, 30 or 40 and one guy's gone, it's like, oh, okay. But when you have, let's say, a small crew where we're running maybe five or six and one guy gets out because he's injured, you know, which we've had happen, you know, on occasions because just things happen. Yeah. That's a big deal. So one of the things we did is one of our trucks, let's talk about in the winter, one of our trucks that we used never plowed snow, but we put the plow mounts on it and made an adapter so you could put two of the Toro snow blowers on the front of the truck instead of in the back of the truck. Nice. In the back of the truck, we used it all for our salt, you know, all the sidewalk salt and little buckets that they could have a pull-out tray. 
So one here. One, I saved the fact of somebody damaging the side of the truck, lifting this heavy snowblower over the side. Two, I didn't have to worry about somebody getting hurt. Maybe it was my truck. Then there was hurt. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and then this, the third thing was, is now the plows are, these little snowblowers are up in the front of the pickup at knee high. So they could pick them up and set them on the ground. The chances of getting hurt there were mitigated substantially. You know, again, we're going back to the simplicity of, okay, what can I do that's, it's just faster. Yeah. What's better? Yeah. What, how can I make it 1% better today? And I'll tell you, i got to just bring this up for you. One of the best stories on the 1% rule is the British cycling team, right? The, um, what do you call it? The coach was led into this British cycling team. This is like 2003 or something. I can't remember the story you can find in the web. He came in and the only thing he did is they said, gosh, we got to make a change. Because the British cycling team was dismal. They were just horrific. They hired a new coach. The coach comes in and he says, we're going to make some changes. And all this coach did, because these are top athletes anyways. These guys are Olympic athletes. All he did was came in and he changed little tiny things. All he looked at was, what can I do that's 1% better for my team? What clothes are they wearing? What are they doing to their bicycles? They, one of the things they did in their, their trucks that hauled their bicycles out was paint the entire truck inside completely white. It was like a clean room for hauling their bikes to make sure that when the bikes got to the event, they were perfectly clean and no dust was on. They were just exact. We looked at bedding. So this principle is a great one for, our, uh, for people in the landscape industry to read. Just look up British cycling team, coach, 1% better. And all he did was just all the little things. And they became one of the top most uh, winning. They won the Tour de France. They won many events because of the little things. It, the principle applies to our landscape business absolutely the same. Mm -hmm. What can I do? One thing better today than I did yesterday. Emotionally, mentally, business-wise, it all goes together. You know? Well, and it seems to be just from my experience, like it's almost a compounding effect when you start doing something here over time. Mm -hmm. It's just like, holy cow, that made a big difference. And you may not see it at first, but then all of a sudden, boom, it's like, holy cow, that helped out so much. It does. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I would say, I know before on our previous conversation we had, we uh, even talked about <clears throat> just how your crews pull around your shop. You mentioned like how you designed it in a way it's, you know, the crews can pull around, oh. pull in and awesome. Like that's the same thing we did. We made a circle path that the crews pull up, they fill up the trucks with fuel, they dump their stuff in the garbage and they pull around and park. It just made it, it made sense after like years of not having that. It's like, <laughs> that was dumb. Yeah. Like, why didn't we do that a long time ago? You know, but I yeah. love that. You might expand into what you guys did. No, it's interesting you say that because what we looked at is as the crews would come back, at that time we were running three three trucks, you know, three three man crews all going out in the maintenance team. As the end of the day would come back, we had our main shop building, we had a small building at that time. They'd come back at the end of the day, you know, you unload the trailers, put everything away for the day, drive around, and we did have a, one gas pump at that time, you could fill up the trucks, and then they'd just get parked. The next day they'd come in. They'd have to do the same thing, load the trucks back up, and it's morning, everybody wants to talk, yada, yada, it's taking up time, you know. They'd load them up again, then we'd give them a thing, and then they'd take off. We started looking at how many, again, this goes back to minutes. How many minutes was each employee taking to unload the truck at the end of the day and then load the truck at the, at the beginning of the next day? You know, by the time they got their stuff ready, by the time they put their fuel in their fuel cans, by the time they got their, you know, mowers and everything tied back down because all our mowers i see a lot of landscapers don't tie them down ours are all tied down everything we get is is tied down we started looking at that how many minutes am i spending every day doing that job and i know a lot of people use you know enclosed trailers for that reason we chose not to use enclosed trailers because they get beat up and then you know for a guy that's just learning to tow a trailer one they were more expensive two it created that person that was driving. He had to be a lot more conscientious of where that trailer was, where and sometimes that created blind spots when you're towing with an open trailer that became really easy. So anyways, we didn't do the enclosed trailers. But we started looking at how much time was spent. And we decided, you know, I've got space. We have, we have land, right? Um, so we said, you know what? We're going to make that, just like you were talking about, a building 
that you can drive in, drive in one side and park everything, all loaded and done. We have gas pumps. So we looked at that and how long it would take us to get our return on our investment for that building. And we decided it was going to be pretty darn fast when you have three, six, nine, like almost 10 guys every morning spending, you know, a minute here and there and doing this. And we'd get our investment back fast enough. So we invested in a uh, much larger building um, that had doors on one side, doors on the other side. At the end of the day, they'd come up, fill their truck up, fill the mowers up at the gas pumps because we invested in more, you know, larger uh, fuel tanks. And then they'd drive into the barn, get out of the truck, clock out, their cars parked right next to the barn in an employee parking area, and then they'd go home. The next morning, they'd come in, walk over to the barn, walk in, get in the truck that they had already prepared from last night before, and take off. So, you know, it wasn't rocket science. You know, it was just a simple thought of, okay, let's see what we're spending yeah. coming and going. It, and so it's those little things, like you said, that make a difference. We, Like you mentioned fuel. I think that alone oh. is a huge time saver, especially if you have the area for oh. it. Like how much yeah. time your crew spend at the gas station getting donuts and coffee or whatever, and then only one guy's filling up. Uh, it was that was a huge time saver and money saver for us. Yes, that that was one of the my first investments. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, before the building, because that's exactly what we looked at: the amount of time being spent. Again, this is so. You know, we think that a lot of these things are very mm-hmm. easy to look at. You know, oh, that should make sense. And some things, you know, we just don't look at, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, when you start going, oh, my gosh, that saves me quite a bundle. Yeah. And it's better for the guys, too. They, You know, it's easier for them to go, okay, they know what they're doing. It's fast and simple. Yeah. Like for for us, it was nice because, uh, like I said, we were spending, the guys would go there in the morning at the time. They were going to the gas station. They were taking all this. So I sat down and, like, I literally figured out to the minute how much it cost us versus having yep. that fuel tank on, on our, our shop site. And my dad saw that and he's like, oh, I guess that makes sense. So like everything I had to present to my dad had to be like data driven, which is fine. I didn't mind doing it, but I just tell him and like, nah, like, all right, here. So I laid it out from him and he's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Let's do that. So that's how, that's how I learned how I had to deal with my dad to get him, let's do this. Let's try this. You know? Yeah. So and it's interesting, were- you know, David did a lot of that first too, where David would mm-hmm. put it together. And again, this goes back to the numbers. Like you, I know yeah. you're, I have a lot of training with that, and that's imperative. Uh, started putting together our Excel spreadsheets that give us our numbers, you know, and, and we can chat about that in a little while or whenever, but that's critical. Yeah. That's not just something you can think about. It's something you should know about. Absolutely. Because you cannot, you cannot be in business and not understand what you're making or what you're losing or how much things are costing because we'll buy it. Let's, we can go into that. You can buy a truck or a mower so that and go, oh, yeah, I got a mower. Well, I can buy a used mower, a used truck. It doesn't matter if it's used or it's new. That's still a cost associated with running that truck. How much it yep. costs a mile to run? How much does it cost to have the employees sitting in that truck driving that mile? Yep. What about the maintenance on the truck? And can you do the maintenance or do you have to sub out the maintenance? All these factors have to be in so you can actually run a business. But yep. if you can't do that, it could be a nice hobby, but it can't be a business unless you know your numbers. <laughs> yeah. I I was actually talking to a coaching client this morning and I'm not going to share exact things, but no. let's just say they, they, they went down and started looking at all their numbers. I broke it down to like how much for one man team, two man team, three man team. And I asked him for their mowing side of like what you typically use. He said, well, two man. So we started running some numbers and it came back that he was only making from what he was charging last year was only 12% gross profit, gross profit. I'm like, okay, what about all your overhead, you know, and your profit you want to have on there? He's like, oh, I guess. I'm like, you know, you've been struggling for a while. Let's, let's look at this. We have to raise our rates or get new customers, whatever, but something has to change that. But he would have never known that or realized that unless he sat down and went through his numbers, like you said, and it's, it's imperative. I, I can't stress it enough. Like you said, it, it's just, you have to, it's a necessity in this business. It, you know, it, it, it's, what it is, is it's a necessity if you want to be in business for any length of time. Well, sure. You yes. know what I mean? Because the majority of our, our, our LCO industry, let's, let's be honest. It's easy to start. Yep. It's a relatively low overhang easy to start business, which then anything that's in that nature creates a lot of competition, right? 
So if I want to be competitive in an industry that's relatively easy to start and has a lot of competition, I've got to figure out a way to do it better. I got to be more efficient. I have to know my numbers. I have to know what I've got to charge to make a living with it. I have to know those things mm -hmm. because anytime you have a super competitive business, if you don't know those, you, you can, you can be worse off than you were before you started. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, a person could be worse off in a business that they started if they had never started it, yep. you know? Absolutely. And Absolutely. To, yeah. And you know, and that brings, and I, sorry, I keep chatting, but that yeah. brings me back to the importance of I did this and it's not for everybody, but I chose to pay for all of my equipment before I did. There's only a few things. There's a few things, you know, okay, I'll get a loan on it if I have to, but those for me in all these years, were very, very few. When we bought our first, uh, even when I, we had an excavating site where we had, I had Kenworth, I had triaxles, I had, you know, larger, much larger equipment. We had multiple dozers. Even those, when I bought those, I could buy them at their thing, but their interest rate was 0%. So I used their money yeah. while I kept mine in the bank, you know, at that time. You know what I'm saying? Right. So oh, yeah. we could still buy the unit, but well, at that time, we'll just use their money, yeah. you know? Uh, an interesting thing, too, when we first started the business, I forgot to tell you this. Sorry, I'll tell you this now. Money is always tight, you know, especially when you have five kids. My wife is a finance genius. I have to give her credit. You know, we had things that we'd put on credit cards. And then when that credit card would come due, well, at this time, well, here's another credit card that's got a 0% interest if you had just changed your balance over to us. And so the first, the first year, we did that a couple of times. Sure. When we first got going with stuff. But again, I never paid interest on any of my credit cards because we watched those things. Again, that's you know, staying out of debt. So yeah. that's not for everybody. Not everybody is going to do that as far as paying for their stuff. I just chose to do it that way. Maybe it's a little slower, good, bad, whatever. It did make me sleep well at night. So when uh, we get a job or we'd lose a job, I'd go, well, that's a bummer. Just go to the next one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But the biggest thing is, is, you understand your numbers. When you lose that job because somebody underbids you, you go, that's okay. Because yeah. I could not do that job and be profitable enough at the rate that they're going to do it. At. And if I'm going to lose money at it, I don't need more practice. <laughs> I've got plenty of that after all these years. I don't need more practice. Then we're going to move on to the job, the next job that will pay what we need to be paid. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, Kind of going back to the organization, is there anything that you could think of or anything that you guys have done, whether it's at the landscaping side, the manufacturing side that you've done to really help keep things organized, to keep your tools organized or keep yourself organized? Is there anything that kind of stands out to you? Yeah. You know, and that, and that again, goes back to our shop layout, you know, in our shop, everything's laid out so it's easy to get at. And, you know, this is, this isn't for everybody. Everybody's, you know, everybody's different. You know, we, bought land so I could actually do something, you know, and, and I'm, I was fortunate enough to come into the right time to find a piece of property that gave us enough land. So we have a five acre plot that our main shop sits in. We have another 11 acre plot where we have our salt barn and all our bins for our materials. It worked out for us. But again, that's where we in the shop. Um, it's clean. I'm kind of anal retentive. I like a clean shop. Because then I like it to be organized. This way we can go in there and find what we need to. So all our tools are laid out nice and neat. Our equipment for like just our hand rakes, our chainsaws, our pole saws, trimmers, all have a place. You know, everything's laid out. Some tools are in the big barn where the trucks park because they're going to be used with the trucks. In the shop is the, you know, the hand tools that we use to repair things. So we have a couple bays. So when a truck or a mower or something has to be fixed, fixed, then we can pull it into the shop. And that was an investment over time that we just started buying the tools that we needed. You know, mm -hmm. so imagine you come into the shop and you have, again, it's just laying it out. How, how can I do it? How, how can I lay it out so it's fast and efficient and clean? Oh my gosh, if you have a cluttered shop, it just drives me nuts. It just, you know, it's a mess. It's got to be clean because nobody wants to work in the filth pot. Yeah, yeah you know what I mean? So his idea yep. of messy is cleaner than most shops I've ever seen. <laughs> I've seen a lot of shops over the years. That's well, it's good. It, it does make a difference. I, 
I was in a mastermind group a long time ago with other landscape business owners and we got to travel around and see different businesses and stuff. And that was amazing. Just like, just walking, like you said, walking to certain shops and like, I remember one shop, everything was like, there were zero things on the bench and everything was like perfectly organized and you go to another shop. It was a little different, you know, a little yeah. things here and there, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see people actually on that note, have you had people, I'm sure you have, but have you had employees that, you know, come into your business and you have everything organized and they weren't so organized. They just kind of threw things willy nilly. How did you handle that? Well, <laughs> David's yeah. got their waving his hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, um, that's a, that's a, that's a good, tough call. It's kind of an individual call with each employee mm-hmm. that you have. You know, we've had some employees that really didn't attach things good to the trailer, like our small power equipment, you know, and all of a sudden they come back and go, I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> You know, and I go, really? I mean, I've had, at that point, you know, you could do it a couple ways. Somebody could get really mad and angry and yell at the person, but that doesn't gain me anything. It creates a rift between you you as the boss and the employee. Now, I'll yell at David because that's another story. But that's I yell story. back. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? So generally when I have an issue, I just try to talk to him as if I was talking to you. I say, you know, it's kind of a bummer, you know, that everything that we do, that if we lose something or we don't put it away, costs us time, costs us, you know, money in the long run. It's money that I, I maybe we could do more, like get you a different piece of equipment that would be better. So everything we do that, you know, creates extra work, you know, we have to figure out how to pay for that. You know, I try to instill a nice place, a nice place to work. I try to, I try to be nice. I try to be cordial. Um, I try to treat them as how I'd want to be treated, except for Dave. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of people where they just get absolutely irate. And I've had bosses that got just yelling and really irate with something I did when I was, you know, a teenager working for them. And I remember that to this day, how much I hate it having to work for that person. Mm-hmm. And this is to say, I didn't do it for very long because I remember how I was treated. Most people leave their job, not because they hate their job, but because they can't stand the management they're working for. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, this is, this is a, you know, a common thing that we had at the steel mill for those 11 years I was there. When somebody becomes upset or unhappy with their work environment or their boss, then things don't go too well on the job because then they become more, well, let's say mischievous, right? Yeah. You know, that could be mischievous with your equipment. That could be less caring of your equipment. So for me, I always try to create, hey, look, guys, please just take care of what you've got because we want to be able to use this for later. We try to make sure our equipment is, is taken care of and we try to replace it when it needs to. But I'm also the adage, I like to use it until it's not usable because yep. again, that's money. And if that tool is still working, as long as it's not just nickel and diming me to death, then I'm going to use it. So to answer that question, you know, uh, the approach is to be kind, you know, it begins with the management, it begins with the person who's running the thing. If you can't do that, well, maybe there's another business for you because figure it out when we talk to our clients, an LCO operator, when he talks to his clients, um, if he's got a sour disposition, that will show up to his clients, yep. and, and you can't have that. The client wants to have you, well, I'd like to say it, they want you to be their friend almost. Yep. You know, And if you can build a nice rapport in just a couple minutes with that person, boy, that pays dividends. And you know yep. what? That paid dividends for us uh, in starting this business because we had – Nobody give us any money. Nobody, no influence to have anybody start funding us money. There was no, this was completely from scratch. There was no, we just put it together. You know what I mean? I didn't have any investors. I didn't have any rich uncles or stuff. I I didn't. And and that works for a lot of us. Um, And a lot of us start the same way I did. Just start a little bit here and just start to go. Yeah. Um, I was told a long time ago by one of my mentors was, uh, you can tell how well the business is organized by go looking at the owner's desk. And if a desk is a mess, 
the prior their business and the prior their life is probably a mess. And <laughs> what did I tell you? I'm not the owner. If you can see my desk, Mike, he always says he's like Einstein because his desk's a rat nest. <laughs> 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 and, and it's you true. Can see it, you can see, my desk, I try to keep it pretty organized, you know, yeah. good or bad, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, to me, it's kind of true. It does, for the most part, I'd say it pretty much stands out for the business that I've been to. It's been that way. If you kind of see it, like, oh, I can see why this place is running the way it is. And, you know, okay. Now, no, I'm not necessarily judging, but okay. Now, what we no. do from there? Yeah. It's it's just always what we do forward. But yeah. yeah this and, is and, is there anything that have you ever run into any issues where things have, uh, you know, been disorganized that really stood out and you realized afterwards I could have done this different? Is there anything that kind of pops out at you? You know, I think that's true for all of us in the LCO industry. You know, we've all run across areas. We go, huh, well, that was a mistake. Mm-hmm. Whether we bid incorrectly, which that happens, it just happens. Yeah. You know, you just hope you don't have too many of those. Um, in the disorganizing things, and I've been, I've fallen short of that. And David's come in and said, you know what, realistically, and this is where management or the boss or the owner really needs to be in tune with his employees. Because you know what, I'm not the smartest, uh, I'm not the brightest bulb in the light bright. I'm not the end all of all, right? I'm not. But if I surround myself with people that are, are intelligent, with people that have got ideas, which we all do makes a big difference to listen. Sometimes the best thing you can do is listen. And I'm not the best at that. I still work at that. But let's say uh, I've had many times where I've done something or I'm getting ready to do something and David or one of the other employees will say, well, hey, Rich, because they can talk to me and that's what I want. They say, you know, realistic, why, have you thought about doing it this way? And sometimes I go, well, yeah, I did, but we're not going to do it that way. And other times I go, well, geez, you're crying. That's a, that's a brilliant idea. You know, and I let them voice their opinion. Tell me what they think, because you know what? If you've got five, ten, or six, you know, let's say five or ten different employees, you know, some will come up with some ideas, some won't. But the number one thing is, is they need to feel comfortable to talk to you as the boss or the owner, or whatever, or the manager, right? They need to have that rapport, that comfort to do that. And so David often will tell me, he goes, "Well, I think you're stupid." And he'll tell me that. And I go, well, that's brilliant. You know? <laughs> and then, you know, and he'll give ideas and I'll say, oh, gosh, I, I didn't think of that. So when it comes to disorganizing areas, you, you know what? The owner, the boss needs to be able to listen to the employees that are around him. And if he can listen, it's a, it's a real skill is to be able to listen. My wife tells me that's a real skill and I need a lot more work on it. But anyways, <laughs> if you can listen, you can learn a lot and you can adjust. And in this business, in our LCO industry, you've got to be able to adjust. And so yeah. oftentimes, employees will come up with an idea that will just lead us into a, a path. And we go, goodness, didn't even think yeah. of that. So yeah. to answer your question, it's listening. It's, it's hearing what your employees may have because we all run into those. We all yeah. run into the spots where you go, well, it wasn't such a great idea. Or that was a bad bid. You know? yeah. And what can we do better next time? So that's how we generally try to handle that. I think that's, that's smart because I, I feel just cause I did, would do the same thing. Having somebody else kind of throw ideas out to you. I feel like I earn more respect from that person, from my foreman or whatever, because I let them throw Absolutely. some ideas out there. And I, I think I earn more respect with them and I earn their respect because, Oh, that is a great idea. You know, and I don't, I have to be the end all be all with everything. I, I love hearing their input. So I've, I've never had any problem with that. I think that's, <clears throat> that's a leadership skill many people have to learn to to deal with. It's it's yes. something you have yes. to learn and, and train and practice with, I should say. Yeah, and it is. It, it, it's a skill, you know, that's, that takes uh, refinement oftentimes. <clears throat> One thing that we did was we had, we called them what's dumb around here meetings. And everybody get together. We come in the morning and tell everybody you have to come present at least one idea of something that's dumb around here, something you don't think is working well or something we could change. But the only thing is you have to at least have at least some kind of idea of how we can go about fixing it. Not saying it has to be perfect, but any idea. And it's awesome kind of hearing some of those things and like some an outside perspective on whatever. You know, we've had people tell us about organize our, our, our trailers better or 
the layout of the shop or whatever, where things are, it's just, it's interesting to see some of those things like he's right. Yeah. I never thought about it this way. Or, or there's been ideas of it like really dumb and like, okay, cool. I heard you. You're not saying that to them, obviously, but you're thinking in your head, I heard you. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. And move on. Yeah. But that was a big thing when we instilled the what's dumb around here meetings, just kind of, it was, and it's, it's kind of a fun atmosphere too. You know, it, it can't be stressful. It's just fun here, you know, to help the improve, improve yeah. the business. That is a so, great idea, actually. That's a great idea, especially yeah. when you have enough crew and enough people. Hang up. Again, there's something I've never thought about, yeah. but it is kind of a light-mindedness way to get everybody involved. Yep. You know, and it, I think one. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was, was, was going to say, I think when I started doing that, that's when people started to feel comfortable to come up to me and tell me certain things. Not knocking my dad, but my dad had a different way of, of leadership than I did, and he was kind of more old school and in your face and yelling at you where I'm like, I want your input. And I would do that. And people at over time doing that became more comfortable coming to me, telling me something rather than my dad. So then I, I may have to go relay that information to my dad if it was needed, but, but it, to me, that kind of helped build that culture and, and, and help in my opinion, really honestly keep people longer in our business. Well, you know, that's it. And here that, that just brought up a really important part, retention. Mm-hmm. Retention in the LCO industry is really a challenge. Yes. And, and, that, uh, and, and it is. And that's just the nature of the, the, the business, right? Um, if an employee feels like he's got a, an input, a say, a feeling of, I, I don't want to call it ownership, but maybe that's what it feels like. They've got a feeling of a belonging. Boy, that makes a big difference in, in keeping people. We've had, uh, you know, we get a lot of changes, but a lot of our employees have been long term, long term meetings in the LCO industry is, you know, three to five years. Mm-hmm. If you keep somebody in that, that's that's pretty decent. You know, um, yeah. it, it makes all the difference to be able to listen, to be able to just go ahead and pull them in and get them involved as much as I can. And again, that doesn't mean that the owner or the boss is going to you know, succumb to every whim that that may that that owner or that employee may come to. But like you did, at least to acknowledge the fact that, hey, you know, that, you know, that's, the, that's an idea. You know, it, it may work, but, you know, I, I think at this time we're just going to keep doing this. Yep. Or, hey, no, that's a great idea. You know, we should implement that now and, and make that change. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, no, that, that's it's, like you said, it, it's hard in this industry. And mm-hmm. I, I kind of pride myself on that we had multiple people that stayed 10 plus years in our business. Uh, oh, that's the, really good. The, the longest guy we had was just a, he was just shy of 15 years. So I think that to me, that was, that was pretty good. That's and really good. Yeah. So I, I kind of pat myself on, that's one of the things I will pat myself on the bat for because it was, it was hard. And, and, and you know, in this area, we lose people over the, cause we, it's a seasonal business here. We tend to lose people over the spring or winter time and they don't always come back. So it, it, to me is, it was kind of a highlight I would say of, of things that I've done just to help keep the people and keep the crews happy and then just keep everybody involved. And, and, and again, it goes back to when you build a, a, a rapport, that you built mm-hmm. a, a an ability for them to feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. If they feel yeah. comfortable, your employees feel comfortable talking to you. You're right. They're more apt to stay with you. So in our industry, as an owner, a boss, that skill is imperative as, as well as learning your numbers, right? You have to be, yeah. well, I guess you can say the people person in some instance. Yeah. So you yeah. can chat with them, so you can listen to them. And acknowledge the fact that, you know, they've got ideas. Yeah. That does make so, a difference. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about JLM and the types of products. I know you mentioned a little bit earlier about the baskets and stuff and go in the yeah. front. Now they all, pretty much they all connect to snowplow mounts. Is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, on that side of the business, again, that goes back to, you know, we, oddly enough, because you have trailers, we have to fix them. So we do all all of our own fab work. You know, I had a lot of welding experience in in that. So uh, fabrication is not a big deal. So we would, we just started building things we needed. We built tools for our excavator, tools for our skid steer. We just go, oh, this would be a good idea. Let's just build it. And so since we had some fab skills and welding skills, uh, you know, we would just make what we needed, right? So on JLM, that just kind of grew out of trying to be more efficient, like we talked about earlier. We just tried to develop products that would help us, right? Mm-hmm. So what we did is we developed them for Western plows, boss snow plows. So once we started going and seeing that there might be an interest in it, and it worked for us, maybe somebody else would be interested in it also. So Western, boss, Fisher, 
Uh, Meyer, we haven't got, but Snow Wing. You know, all those plows, we made this, let's call it a carrier. Um, for those that are familiar with the industry, a front end loader has a, a quick mount called the JCB front mount. It looks like that. If, if you could say, so you got a quick attach on a front end loader. But imagine this carrier slides into your plow mounts and it, it slides in there. And now you have this carrier on the plow mount. And then David and I designed, uh, I should say David did all the CAD work. I um, mean, we talked about what we wanted from the carrier that's into the plow mounts. Now you have attachments that just hang on the carrier. So for us, we took, and this goes back to our trucks. I got to do this for a second. This is my squirrel moment. I took the landscape, the uh, pickup beds off our trucks, just got rid of them. We took the beds off our trucks and we built our own flat beds because for me, a truck is, it's a work vehicle. And the best way to make that truck work is to have the space available on the back of that bed. Now it took David a little while to convince me to do that. And that was one of his ideas. But we created and made our own flat beds. You know, because I couldn't find one that I liked, so we just made our own. Mm -hmm. um, so we made those. And then on the front of the truck, we decided with these carriers, we wanted a place to hang like our cones. So if we had a big a, a bobcat attachment uh, that's sitting on the bed and the bobcat in the trailer, our track loader with some other attachment like a grappler or something, you couldn't put everything in there. But again, I could put the big bush hog or the six foot or seven foot bush hog on the back of the truck in the flatbed, the other stuff on the trailer, in the front of the truck on our carrier. Now all of a sudden we can haul our weed whackers, our spools, our fuel tanks, our um, cone holders, because we made cone holders, because you got to have cones if you're out on the road. So we put a place for cone holders, so you'd have a toolbox, cone holders, all the stuff in the front of the truck. Trucks are too darn expensive to not utilize the truck completely. We just don't think of the truck front of the truck as being useful. I get a lot of people that say, oh, it's going to catch the truck on fire, it's going to overheat, and da 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 No. We've never had a problem. I can tow the track loader that's 12,000 pounds with a toolbox in the front, the cone holders, all that stuff on it, and they don't overheat. You, you run it with things. a snowplow. I, I know. Yeah. I have <laughs> more heat issues in the winter with snowplow I do. than yeah. we do with a toolbox yeah. at 90 degrees. At 90 degrees. I have more issues yeah. with that. Modern cooling systems are, are adequate. You know, we're not blocking the old front. I've had at times are worth the toolbox. It's a buyer's toolbox we run in the front. Anyways, the lid flipped up, completely blocked the radiator. I'm towing a trailer home. I now you run the gauges on a truck so we can see the display. It's saying what, what the temperatures are. You look at trans temperature and stuff. And I go, well, that's funny. The gate must have flipped up because now I'm two degrees hotter than what I was normally. You know what I mean? So <laughs> JLM was invented or we designed it so we could be a little bit more efficient with that stinking expensive truck. So I can carry stuff in the front of the truck and have my bed, my flatbed full of something else. Because when we put like the bush hog in the back of the bed, that fills the bed. That fills the bed. You know, yeah. it takes up the entire space of that truck. And then I have oftentimes the track loader, our, our, our big track loader in the back with a grapple or something else. Or I have the dozer blade I'll put on the bed. You know, it depends on the job we're doing. And again, I, I'm, I'm eradicating another truck in another trailer. Hence yep. the flatbed. But JLM's idea was to utilize the truck, everything, front, back, everything, you know. Um, it's and so those man. products just came out of it. We build them all here. We have a, a CNC plasma table that we, we invested in. We have a, a Amada a CNC 50-ton uh, hydraulic brake press. That's CNC operated that we have. We have uh, multiple welders, plasma torch, hand torches. Hydraulic pipe benders and tube benders. Yeah, it's kind of an odd. That goes back to the eclectic weirdness of, a, of our landscape business. <laughs> but we did all this so we can build whatever we need. Just about everything. So you, mind so, sharing, cool. hmm? um, so you mind sharing uh, just the, some of the types of products? I know you have a bunch of different types of attachments. You mind just sharing some of those with the listeners? Yeah, so imagine this carrier is pushed into the plow mounts. It looks like a bull bar. It looks like a bull bar. It has a bar in the top and a bar in the bottom. And so if you're looking at it, there are two parallel bars that are parallel with the ground, right? Separated um, by about, is it 18 inches apart the bars are? Roughly 16, 16 inches apart. Two parallel bars. 
So for those that can see your podcast on YouTube, you've got two parallel bars attached that go into the truck. Okay, amazing. So on that carrier, we have attachments like we run um, a two-inch receiver hitch. We can bolt into the into that carrier. The cone holders bolt to the carrier. We made the carrier's design so that somebody who has fab work that they can do in their own place, they can attach lights to it. We have a light bar bracket. We have a license plate bracket for it. We have a basket so we can put two wheelbarrows. You know, they eight, do they eight cubic foot wheelbarrows? Yeah. You know, the big yellow dual mm-hmm. wheel ones. Yep. A basket that uh, you can put the wheelbarrows in, a plate compactor. We have a 30-gallon water tank, 50-gallon water tanks that you can put on the front. Think about this. We carry a 1,200-pound plow in the front of our truck that sticks literally four feet in front of the axle. <laughs> you know? And eight feet wide. And eight feet wide. So we're, those in the center, we're used to putting stuff in the front of our trucks. You know, So we yep. just put a basket on. We put the tools or the accessories that we need to use. Uh, for us in the summer, we have a toolbox with our cone holders attached to this carrier. It just literally hooks on and pins, no tools. So you can change out attachments really quick. Uh, but ours, we run four-foot toolboxes. We put our gas in there, our, our trimmers, uh, hedge trimmers, uh, trimmer spool string, you know, stuff that's easy to walk off. That goes back because we have a flatbed. I hate to say it, but things like to just grow legs and leave. It happens. We've had it, some things just uh, grow legs and leave on us at certain areas. Yep. Out of sight, out of mind, we put it in the front in the front toolbox. And for us, it works. You know, we have a system where they can mount. Uh, gosh, we've got them. So they got some guy put his Yeti, a Yeti cooler. He runs his Yeti cooler in front of his truck. We've had a few customers that are bought them out, out west and or out east, you know, um, that u- utilize them. One of the biggest things that we've had, you know, that, we love that system, and it works great for us. And we have our website developed for that. We're working on a Shopify site. But one of the other things we developed, and everybody knows about this at Plow Snow, so we're going to go there if you don't mind for just a second. We have a skid loader. A person, a, a company, they have a skid loader. What's the first thing they do? They take the uh, summer tires off, and they put these skinny winter tires on their skid steer. Why do they do it? Because they know it's going to provide better traction and they can plow with it and they don't destroy their expensive summer tires. Well, we developed a setup for compact wheel loaders. And so we run, we call them their polar grip snow tires. And the idea again, this all goes back to trying to be better than what we were before. This is that 1% principle, right? Knowing my numbers, how much does it cost to run this? Da, 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 da. How much gas am I using? How much fuel am I burning? So we developed after David they had to convince me a little bit because it's an investment. It took me about two years. Yeah. And we ran the numbers, figured out what kind of fuel we're using, what we're losing, how much we're spinning on the tires, blah, blah, blah. So we ran a 244J John Deere. And what we developed are a way to attach semi-tires, 11R22.5s or 11R24.5s to the John Deere wheel. Loader. We call them polar grip wheels. So we talked to man- axle manufacturers, all the different axle manufacturers that we could find that deal with Case, New Holland, uh, what's the other one? Gel, Gel um, Deer. Is, yeah, I'm drawing I've been, she's a huge Takeuchi, long list at this point. Takeuchi. We've got, we talked to them all so we could get their bolt patterns and all that stuff and figure out offset spacing and everything like that. Uh, companies where we could buy the rims. Um, and we developed these wheels so you can take that same idea that you would use on a skid steer and apply it to a compact wheel loader. So now on a compact wheel loader, I'm running taller tires. They're thinner tires, meaning they're narrower. So one, I picked up ground speed. On our 244J, we picked up three mile an hour road speed. That road speed for me versus the guy next to me, I just want to be 1% better. He's running 18 mile an hour, depending on the deer he has, 18.6 mile an hour, I'm doing 21 to 22. If I had a faster deer, like the newer models that are running 22, 23 now, and I put my taller tires on them, I'm gaining an equivalent two or three more mile an hour. So what I tell people is I say, look at this. In that eight-hour day, or let's say six hours, that we're plowing snow, because we all do it, for those that have a compact wheel loaders. I'm going even just two mile an hour faster than you. In six hours, I'm covering and roading 12 more miles. I can go farther than you. I can get to my sites faster. I'm not spinning my wheels. I'm not burning up my expensive summer tires. This all, all these things... Go back to just what can I do that's a little bit better than the competition I'm dealing with. 
Hence, what are my numbers? How much does it cost me to do this? And what am I going to gain from it? You know, if I understand and know those things, you can make a living doing uh, being an LCO. And you, yeah, some people do really well, and, and kudos to them, and I'd love to hear about them. But even in the normal room, let's call it, you know, I'm going to say just a normal LCO. It's supported my family. It's supported my employees. You know, we, you know, we're not, I'm not going to say wealthy. But you know what? We've all been able to do what we wanted to do. And it's all about being a little bit better than what I was before and not how much I made, but how much I kept and how could I keep more in my pocket than I'm spending? You know, I love it. Great, great information for those that are interested in finding a little bit more about JLM. How can they get hold of you? How, where, what's the website and everything? Our website is, um, you know, triple W J L M outfront.com. Our Facebook is, you know, facebook.com slash out front mounts. And that's that. We have an Instagram page and we have a YouTube page that we're working on. My son, uh, uh, Bryce Johnston is um, our social media guy and he's, he does all our videos. So we have some videos up of the, the production of how we make um, our carriers, you know, who does our powder coating for them. You know, we have our, uh, our landscape Facebook page, at, you know, um, Facebook slash Johnston landscape. So some people go out there and see some things we've done, you know, and, um, and are you, those are our website pages our and our Facebook pages. And those are the best way to get out there and see what we're doing. You know, um, it's worked for us, you know, mm-hmm. it's worked for it. us. That's great. I, <clears throat> I just love, like you said, just the getting 1% better, being a little more organized, a little more efficient with your, your time and just using something that's not. It's really just what kind of, I shouldn't say wasted space, but it, you know, space is not getting used for anything else and having it. And it's also the safety issue. So there's a lot of factors just having that, that implement on there. So it's awesome. It does. Again, it it, it worked for us and we developed them for us. Yep. And we found that other people have gone, oh, that's a great idea. It works for them too. And, you know, hopefully it'll work for them. We're not going away. We've been in the landscape business for a while. You know, we like what we do. Uh, we like the manufacturing side, you know, so we like to do that too. For those yeah. LCO, uh, the, our, for the operators out there, the most important things are learn what your business costs you to run. And in your sense, with your coaching, they need to have somebody that can coach them. It's imperative that they learn that number because it's not only good for them individually, it's good for the entire industry. Because as soon as everybody can be on the same page and understand how to run their business, our whole industry is better. So it's a major benefit to learn, right? Knowledge is power. And it is, and it is truly needing to be there. Learn your numbers. Be kind to your employees. Create an environment that works for people. Make it so that they don't feel, the employees don't feel slighted when they come to work. Give them an opportunity to grow. You know, when you have certain things and certain employees, give them the chance to grow, listen to their ideas, you know, Um, and those things are, I think, are essentials, you know, learn how to fix your own stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I I agree with you. Like, I don't know how some of these people send all this stuff out. I'm like, holy cow, that has to cost an arm and a leg. I mean, I get certain things if you don't have the equipment or whatever. Absolutely. But for the basic stuff, you, you should be able to at least learn or have somebody learn from your team. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you know, think about the, the guy that's just mowing. He's only doing mowing and he has to sub his blades out to be sharpened. He has to sub out the work to do that. It, it won't work. Yeah. If you're having to pay somebody to take care of all the routine maintenance on your zero turns or your walk behinds or even your little small commercial mowers, you've got to know how to do that because yeah. it'll, it'll just, it'll eat you up. The yeah, labor absolutely. cost to send all that equipment will eat you up. So well, we yeah. did, I say we ran the numbers after a while. We had a, a part-time mechanic that would come in and just help keep up some of the stuff because we, we were over yeah. a million dollar business. So we had, a, yeah. you know, quite a few pieces of equipment and stuff and things would break and just have them come in and help keep things going just here and there. Or, you know, it, it was worth it after a while, but for the longest time, it was my dad and myself. That was it. You know, I'd be <laughs> after the job's all done, you're in there till hours, whoever knows at night trying to fix well bang, whatever you had to do to yeah. get it back going. So, to get it back to life. Yeah, yeah. You it, it, but, to. but then again, too, see there, the, the important message is you knew your numbers. 
Yeah. So you knew when you could afford or when it was beneficial to have that part-time mechanic come in. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, and again, that goes back to your coaching. You, you just, they have to know that. Yeah. Yeah. Because and then you can pick that out. So you you had somewhat of a life and you could per, you know, put your time into other things. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, really that's, what that's what it was, is, is understanding the numbers and realizing I can go out and do more making sales and, and doing the other things that, and then have somebody else do the, the repair of something. It was just, it just made financial sense and we could sell more work and do things. So, but it's just, yeah. it's like you said, you you ran the numbers, you ran the numbers into how to get that machine two miles an hour faster or whatever and everything yeah. done it, it. You have to spend the time doing it. You can't just keep going out doing things over and over. And why is it not getting better? If you're not checking that stuff, you don't have any idea. You're just guessing. <laughs> you know, and it's really funny when you start looking, when we start doing, David put together an entire spreadsheet. So we figured out when we go, like in just mowing maintenance, how many linear feet of trimming are you doing? Because trimming is usually the most expensive thing. Zero turn mowing, you know, just mowing is relatively quick and easy for the most part. But that guy trimming often depends, you know, time wise. So in our calculations, it was how many linear feet of mowing? How many square foot of grass is cutting? How much time is it going to take for him to walk to blow things off? How much area do you have to blow off? And that leads me to another thing we did. None of my zero term mowers are side discharge. I have none. Everything we have is true mulching decks. Nice. Good or bad, people will say, well, you know, I can't do that. But I have never in 22 years had a discharge from a mower break a glass, dent a window, or, or dent a car, or hit siding. In 22 years, I've not had a problem. Now, in the spring, it takes a little bit more horsepower. It takes a little bit extra cleaning time, right? There's some, there's some nuances with that. But for me, it's perception. How does the person that's driving down the road see me when I'm at just mowing the property? What do they perceive me to be? Am I the guy with the side discharge blowing it out in the road? Am I blowing it under their house? Am I blowing the grass on their landscape beds? I didn't want to do that perception of our industry that's everything for the business guy so for us we mulch i can side i can trim on the right side i can trim on the left side with the mower and we can go around the properties and the clean up and blow off is negligible yeah, so there's a little bit more time in mowing less time in cleanup so in our calculations in excel when david put it together linear feet mowing square footage how long is it going to take to blow off how long is it going to take to get there we figured out a routes so how many miles am I driving there? How many people are in the truck? Um, how much gas does that trimmer use per a given moment? How much gas does the lawnmower use? We figure out how much gas the lawnmowers are using when they're running. How much string are we using? That's kind of subjective, but you try to get a guess to it. Yep. You know, we tried to look at every little iota of everything that was being spent and put it into a spreadsheet. And then we said, okay, we need to have X amount of percentage of profit from that property in those calculations to so dig. And my hat's off to him. He put it all together so we can look at it and go, okay, we need 10% profit or 12 or 15 or 20 or whatever. Type that number in and we can look and see what our numbers are. So when we do a property estimation, we can look and calculate instantly what it should be. Now that takes some experience and we can look at the market value and go, okay, well, the market's really bearing here. If I lower that profit percentage down you know, 1% or 2%, can we still do it? Uh, we still going to be enough to make it worth our while. And so we've done it that way. What I find is generally, um, oftentimes we're a little higher. Our, our values are a little higher than most. But having that um, spreadsheet and knowing your numbers makes a big difference. So yeah, Every, everybody, needs a David. everybody needs a David. <laughs> everybody needs a David. Everybody needs a David because, yeah, my hat's off to them. A CAD designer and, uh, uh, and then basically an engineer with CAD and then Excel. It's yeah. made all the difference because that's how we did JLM too. He set it all up. So we figured out material costs and time and plasma time and end time, blah, 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 you know. Nice. Um, so we could actually calculate a cost for each product. David, you uh, have any thoughts or anything you want to add to anybody out there? And he's pretty well covered it all. Okay. The wheels, I, I sat there and I thought about it because we had done the same thing on our skids here. Yeah. And I <clears> clearly... <throat> tell that it does help the actual push. Skate series, you don't run them down, run them down the road, so it doesn't matter for that. But I did the math, and I'm looking at the machine that I've been running for years, and I'm like, there is this much space over top of the wheel before you hit the fender. There's room to work. 
and I'm measuring, I'm doing, I'm thinking about doing the math. I, and I find a tire calculator. I figure out the differences. I'm like, I'm saving 36 seconds every mile I go down the road. And my route's 12 or 14 miles when I'm plowing every day. Yeah. And then previously, we had a big three-yard loader than my little one. And we'd redo a big warehouse where it was a over a quarter mile all continuous these, run. Yeah, and all these uh, distributions. If we got there. more than four inches of snow, I could not do a straight push. I'd have to go out the middle and push out from the middle to each end. Once I put the new tires on, since they're significantly narrower, I was able to push past his three yard loader. Yeah. And then going down the road, we actually, one time it was, you know, three o'clock in the morning, we came back on a four lane highway. I passed him. Yeah, it's Indiana 49. <laughs> okay. It was pretty, yeah, it was a highway 49. You're going north. So we're heading from like the county fairgrounds, going down 49, heading north. Okay. On Indiana 49. Usually he'd walk away yeah, from he's me because he's, he is a faster machine. Yeah. I No, he couldn't keep up. <laughs> oh, I was pretty irritated at that point. Yeah, I was like, seriously? Yeah, because it mine was a it was a Doosan. It was a, a DL two fifty. It was thirty six thousand pound machine. It was a great machine. You know, at that time we bought it new. And when he went past me and I couldn't catch him, I thought, "Are you kidding me?" The only reason you could catch me is the Hydra just isn't efficient climbing a hill. But once I got back on the flat, I ran away yeah. from him. And, and that's where it was. It was that simplicity of going, "Okay, nice." It made it faster. So yeah. there's not only those factors, but there's the factor you don't think about. Those tires, the stock ones on the machine, they're twenty five hundred dollars a piece, almost three thousand dollars a tire is four of them. Yeah, depending on the machine. So some of them get for less, but still, my machine's a two thousand nine. We still have the stock tires because we switched to these snow tires about eight years ago. Yeah, they're a little worn. You know, the summer tires are a little worn down. They're good for summer work. They, yeah. I would not want to plow them. No, but yeah. they're fine for summer work. Even though you look at our, our tire cost is probably going to be between fifty five and six thousand, depending on shipping to get them somewhere. You then compare that to what it's going to cost you to replace the stock tires, and then add the benefits of running them, which yeah. also includes a, a slightly lower fuel burn. I noticed I went from about one point seven gallons per hour to one point three or one point four because okay. of, probably because of my road spending, resistance. Yeah, yes. I'm yeah. spending less time roading. I'm getting from point A to point B a little bit faster. I'm not spinning my tires. I can actually plow faster, period. Yeah. I can I can clear my plow factors so I'm not trying to pick up piles over and over again because I just can't go. I can make full long pushes. So there's all kinds of benefits to these things. And and we've sold five or six sets. No six, I seven, eight sets. Now. A lot to New York, one to Canada, Minnesota, yeah. I think. Yeah, I've had a couple of guys here, local our local guys that have bought um, bought them here. We've got one. We sold one set to a guy that has two identical machines. Yeah. One has them. One does not. The guy that does not have them hates the guy that does. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's, it's funny because we know him personally, you know. So it's it's funny to listen to their yeah, jab each other, you know, because the one's fast and they know it, you know. So it's fun to see it. You know, nice. and, and those are things. Again, it, it works. It's, it was a great little setup that we did. You know, we did it for us, and we said, "Oh, that's a good idea. Let's see if somebody else would like it." And so we sell a few sets. But how about this? Not one person who's bought them has been unsatisfied. They've all so understood as soon as they put them on their machine, they recognize the benefit. Increased speed, increased traction. And those tires, we had one set on there for six years. Six straight <laughs> Six years. straight seasons. Wow. I burned off maybe a sixth, sixth of an, of an inch. inch. <laughs> and then treads were an inch and sixteenth deep. Yeah. Wow. So they're logging tires from semis. Yeah. So they lost nice. great. They they offer great traction. So and if you happen fun. to wreck one, you know, pop, pop up while you're running, just call any semi service yep. place. They can come put a tire on for you. Four hundred bucks. Four hundred sure. to five hundred dollars. Boom! You got a you got a new tire on you. That's that's Unlike that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah, it, it worked good. Nice. We're 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 a unique shop in that sense that we can yes. we make all this stuff here. We can we we do it. We still mow. We still do landscape projects you know we don't do any more realistically like uh, landscape designs we're not doing water work you know water uh, features for us it's a, a lot of maintenance and then it gets into a lot of equipment we have since we have excavators track loaders mini track loaders mini track loader by the way gosh that's one of the best tools you can buy like a ditch witch or dingo that class yeah we They're bought an SK, machines. ditch witch sk 800 i love it absolutely been the best i can say that's almost been our best money maker lately yeah. yeah. 
they're they're a game changer. Once you get one, you're like, how did I do this stuff without it? <laughs> That's yeah. literally what we said. Yeah, yeah, that's really it. That's really yeah. it. We've done a lot of jobs that we couldn't do because we have the bigger stuff. Yeah. But then we feel that niche and it's just like in heaven. The other thing we did out in one of our shops, sorry, I won't keep you, but another Are one to take up too much time. But we have a bunch of attachments for our Bobcats and our Ditch Witch. I have a plethora of attachments. And that was because it, if I can save a minute, and not hurt my back because I'm getting lazy and I can have a piece of equipment do that job for me. We're going to buy it, you know, as we could do it. So we palletized everything outside in the big shop. So one of our shops is just a wall of all pallets, you know, pallet racking. Mm-hmm. And each attachment has its own place from snow blowers to grapples, to bush hogs, to a vibratory roller, to Harley rake, dozer blades. The only things we store outside are the buckets. Yeah. That's and- it. Everything and, is under a roof. Yeah. And they're on a rack too, though. <laughs> yeah. nice. The buckets have to be on a rack. I don't put them on the ground. Yeah. You know what I mean? They all have their little spot where they reside. You know? it's, it's, that's smart. That's what we did. We have the same thing. We have pallet racks. Our local yeah. Sam's Club was getting rid of them a long time ago. So when dad went over there, got them, purchased them, whatever. And yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. So much, such a space saver. <laughs> just that. It self. Is, isn't it? It, yeah. Again, we chatted earlier in the discussion, uh, organization. Yep. Yeah. It's a way to organize the disorganized. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, well, this has been an amazing. That, co- oh, go ahead. Well, one thing that uh, landscape office should uh, keep in mind is don't be afraid to go outside of your industry to do work. We yeah. have a job of local warehouse right near us where oh. it's been empty for five years. Well, they were going to get it ready to to bring in some new new people. Um, a new company, Dollar General moved in, and then there's a a trailer component yeah, factory Lippert, in. Lippert Industries or something like that. they okay. had all the old pallet racking that was put up 50 years ago I think oh, I mean it was old oh. they needed it taken out they needed they just needed manpower so we went in and we did that in one winter when it wasn't snowing yeah it was three weeks of winter work while it wasn't snowing that we removed acres it was oh my gosh we filled up so much steel steel racks and that's a good point you know uh, that goes back to being eclectic, not not being afraid to, to reach out just a little bit out of your niche. We've also cleaned yeah. up repossessed homes, cleaned out all yeah. the garbage we, dumps. We've, we've torn down homes. Yeah, we've torn down, down um, trailers. trailers at trailer parks. Yeah, we've done a lot yep. of demolition work. Don't, don't a, think you're only one thing. Yeah, we, we do the same thing in the wintertime. We've done, we used to go up to Gary. We got called up to Gary a couple times at town near us. We go there, yeah. clean up some of those homes up there in the wintertime with keep our crews busy. Like we tried. We tried pallet repair for a while in the wintertime. We only did that one season. That was a terrible idea. Uh, that, at least for us, it was, it was that's terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. So don't recommend that. But, we, you know, we tried, like you said, you have to be willing to try different things and see if it works. And, you know, some some are winners and some aren't. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's exactly it. That's exactly it. But you know what? And they all said, the person can still make a living in it. The person yeah. can still do okay as an LCO. In, in, yep. Even in regards to all the competition, if you do it right and you understand and don't sink yourself into debt, because mm-hmm. debt, you got to remember that interest never sleeps. It doesn't care if you're sick. It doesn't care if you don't feel good that day. It doesn't care if it's raining. Interest never sleeps. Yep. So if you can kind of uh, keep that under control in your debt and build your business, you know, and just don't try to do everything right away. Just kind of grow it steadily. I think it'll pay dividends for a very competitive industry. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I'm sure you've I'm sure you've seen in some of the areas around here where some there's some landscapers. I, I question how much debt they have, and they have driving around these oh. brand new trucks and like everything like overnight. It's not like it was built up. It was like no. bam, like holy cow! What, what did you get win the lottery exactly. or something? What's going yeah. on? <laughs> and, and we see it all the time. Well, how many yeah. how many fire sales have we seen at the end of the winter when they run up <laughs> all these trucks and all these plows and all of a sudden, oh, at the end of the winter, we had not a good winter and yeah. all this stuff's for sale. In my yeah. business, I've never counted winter money in the business. Yes. Yep. In other words, the monies we earn during the year are the men, are the making, the time we make the money. The winter is just a caveat. Yes. Hey, I'm going to buy a new piece of equipment with my winter money I just earned. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yep. So winter money for us is never accounted for. In other words, I don't count on it being there. Look at the winters we've had lately. Yeah, yeah. For oh, us, yeah. you know, for us in, in, in the northern hemisphere, or not hemisphere, but the northern areas where we yep. like the plow money, 
but um, anyways. Yeah, no, it's smart. <clears throat> guys, this has been an amazing conversation. I appreciate all your, your input and your thoughts and everything you guys shared with us. Is there anything you'd like to share with any of the audience before we uh, head out today? No, I think we bored them in long enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> one, one piece of advice I would give is don't confuse busy with productive. Yes. If you're yes. just doing things and doing things and doing things and not actually getting anywhere, you're, why? You're why just wasting it? your time. Yeah. yeah. I, I would agree with that. Absolutely. That's a, that's a smart thing. Guys, yeah. go check out JLM. They got some amazing products on there. Uh, they, they do some amazing things. Um, and, and it's, it's, again, it's all about being organized, about being efficient, using what you have and just simply being able to slide it into your already existing plow frame. That's, that's genius. So guys, I encourage you to go check that their program out, go hit them up on social media, give them a like, give them a follow. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate you guys being here today. Look forward to having you guys back on the podcast. This has been please. fun. Yeah, please. We'd love to, we'd love to bore your, uh, your people again. <laughs> I may, I may have to come out, pay you guys a visit or something and uh, see your shop and everything. I'd love to love to do that someday. You no, know, you should. You should come by and see. And, and that could be something we could. We'd love to show you how we've organized our space. Yeah, you know? that'd be that will be an amazing time. Maybe we'll do a little yeah. YouTube video or something. So perfect. All right. We'd love it. All right, guys. Thank thanks. you, guys. And we'll be talking right. soon. Bye bye. All right, Scott. Thanks. thanks. Bye.